I think they're suckling now, so let's try see if we move around a little bit. I'm not sure we're actually going to get a better view, but let's just try. Just worried that the little ones are going to run. So. So Matt, you're 10 years old and you want to know how old these baby hyenas are. Well, we don't know exact day of, of when they were born, but we can have a rough estimate. So we started to see the hyenas back in this area around February. That's when they started to come back. And there were tracks around this area from sort of the end of February. So I would say that these little ones now are probably about five weeks, maybe a little bit between four and six weeks. That's what my estimate is going to be, somewhere around there. They're still black in coloration and they're starting to grow a little bit. So they're not brand, brand new, but I would say about five to six weeks old. I'm just trying to see where Ribbon is lying. Ooh, it's difficult where she is now. Dave, can you see through that gap there? So it's going to be quite difficult for a little bit. So we're going to sit here and just see if maybe they're going to come out again and we're going to be able to see a better view. And while we do, let's jump across to Taylor, who's got a bird before it flies away. We've got a baby bird. We've got a baby or a fledgling Cape turtle dove. This is a first for me. It was actually sitting down on the ground with mom. And then, obviously, when they saw the car, they were quite nervous, so they got up and they flew away. Her mom is just off in the distance, and this is the little one, and it was still learning to fly. It was so funny to see. It couldn't, almost couldn't make it up to the top of this branch. It's actually quite high off of the ground. It must be about three meters off of the ground, so it did a good job. But if you have a look very closely at it, one is you can see, look at its head. Look at all that little bit of fluff that they've got going on over there. Hasn't really got proper feathers on its head just yet. But it's starting to develop its wing feathers and it's, well, it's got enough wing feathers to allow it to fly. But this is so funny. Craig said that this looks like a very mangy bird and it does indeed. But it's awkward for anything little and particularly the birds. They're not so sort of uh, beautiful looking like the adults. And even a turtle dove I think is beautiful. And they're the, I think that they're the most graceful flyers as well. But not this one. This one's still got a lot to learn. But it will go around with mom and dad and learn to forage, learn to peck for seeds. And that's what, it, what they were doing, is they were teaching this juvenile the ins and outs of foraging. I just think that this is so sweet. Don't you? I've never seen a baby turtle dove like this in the wild. Oh, its big beak almost looks bigger than its head. <laughs> it's a funny looking thing. Remember the baby hardy dar chicks as well? How hilarious they were to, to see. They again also weren't the prettiest. But you see, it's, it's getting along well in life. It's starting to learn to preen its feathers and how important it is to have those hooks that are in the feather realigned. Otherwise, they're not going to make very good job for flying. And I think that's what's probably happened there. Firstly, the lack of flying feathers of, uh, of the various primaries and secondaries. And then, of course, I think it looks a bit tatty still. It almost looks like it's still got quite a bit of its down feathers. You can see on its underside. It's very, very fluffy indeed. Now, I'm trying to figure out how old these birds would be, but I haven't really got a clue. This is unbelievable. I really just can't get enough of having a look at this bird. I just think it is so amazing to be able to see something like this. Can we have another look, please, Craig? Can we try and go into the beak again? Because it's got no feathers on its head, it can't be particularly old. I wish that stick wasn't there. I'm going to guess and say that this bird is around just shy of a month. Maybe 25 days old, somewhere around there. But I'm obviously, I'm just guessing now. Because normally when they leave the nest, they've got more feathers on their head. But it could fly, it can fly. So maybe it fell out of the nest and then wasn't able to get back in it. And now it's just sort of moving around with mom and dad. It's got one tail feather. <laughs> what a funny scraggly looking thing.
Project Alpha, now you're wondering why do turtle doves sometimes call at night? And it's an interesting question because we're experiencing it a, it a lot at the moment. Turtle doves, monotonous larks, and helmeted guinea fowl are prime culprits for calling when the moon is out. So remember, it's often you hear them only calling uh, when you uh, have a full moon or just to the lead up or the or just after the moon is a uh, full moon. If the sky is very bright and the birds will call right through the entire evening. Otherwise, you don't really hear them on a cold, cloudy evening when there isn't much light, not even starlight. You won't hear them singing a word. So that's what it's really just got to do with. I think let's move on because I'm sure mom and dad are probably quite worried about this little chick. <laughs> <laughs> it just tried to fly again. It's gone up to the next branch, but it is so funny because it's got one tail feather sticking out. There we go. You see that white one? And it, it can't fly very well. It's, <laughs> it's sort of like a chicken, the way that it's flying at the moment. It really does remind me of a little chicken. Right, now let's see, Megan tried to say something, but I think the mics didn't key properly. Right, right we're going to leave our baby bird and hopefully they are reunited with mom and dad, which I have no doubt will happen. We're going to head towards the Chitwa Dam and have a, a squiz around there. Steph has found himself another spider. From baby birds to baby spiders, although these have yet to hatch. This is the egg sac on the left hand side of the, the branch that you're looking at. That white conglomeration there is an egg sac. And mommy spider is just underneath and hanging. There we go, in the middle of your screen there. Have a look at that beauty. She is about as big as your palm. So if you open up your hand, just your palm without your fingers, that's as big as what she is. And this is the water spider, the spider that we see so often bouncing around on top of the water. That is one. She is beautiful. Looking after her egg sac there. The very protective mom. Nice to know that spiders have a sort of parental care, don't you think? Not all spiders do, but a lot of spiders do. They will carry around their egg sacs. They will guard their egg sacs. They will make sure that the next generation of little spiders is well looked after and in this particular case this mommy would ferociously attack uh, anything that came even close. This is her, not her final act here but she's from a biological point of view this is the last act that she will do. She will, after this when winter comes she will die. But that is what she's done. She's fed herself nice and healthy over the entire summer time gleaning off insects that have fallen into this pan, built up enough metabolic energy to lay some eggs, was ambushed by a very clever male that managed not to get eaten, hopefully, and uh, was fertilized, and now her eggs are being looked after here. Her baby, babies will hatch and she'll carry on. Very nice. Red Fire Queen, you've asked me why is it so big? Um, by it, I would imagine your, the egg sac, or by it, I would imagine the spider. I don't really know, but what I'll do is I'll answer both for you. Um, the egg sac is not really that whole thing. That, that's, that's the silk that protects the eggs. The eggs will be spun into that, and not all together. The eggs will be slightly apart, so it could be a lot smaller than that. But the eggs are given space to breathe, basically, and not all clumped into the same thing. If you were asking about the spider, why is she so big? Female spiders need to be a bit bigger than the males because they've got to produce these eggs. The smaller, the, the smaller you are, the more difficult it is to produce eggs, which are, from a metabolic point of view, actually very difficult to, to produce. Um, James, this morning on Safari, for instance, was it this morning or was it yesterday? may have been last night, uh, was talking about chameleons and the difference between chameleons that are laying eggs and chameleons that lay live young. And in this particular case, for her to be big and offer protection to the eggs, uh, she needs to be a fairly large spider and that's exactly what she's doing. So large spiders unfortunately need large prey though and that's not always the easiest thing to come by. But these spiders live on this pan. This is a naturally forming pan or natural pan in this area. This is about as big as they get as well. 
And this pan has even had hippopotamus in it. I've walked into a hippo that's jumped out of this pan before. Very nice pan to come and have a look at uh, in the dry season. Quite deep as well. Buffalo lion here. And it's a permanent water source. And of course, you're going to be getting lots of spiders, healthy spiders, generation after generation after generation of healthy spiders living here. And so she's a prime example of a water spider. Very nice. This is some wild rice, I think. Yep. I've been waiting for these to come right. Oh, there's another spider underneath and a sack spider there. So that is the sack of a sack spider. And why I pulled my hand away like that was because it was, shame, I think this is actually it. So it's not the Bushveld sack spider, which is lucky for us. It's just another smaller one, I think. Come back onto your web, I'll put you down. Whoa. You don't want to be bitten by a sack spider. They are one of the four spiders that are of medical importance out here. And so you want to be a little bit wary around these spiders. This is not the Bushveld sack spider, I thought it was. But nevertheless, it's got a nice home. Now quite common for spiders to lose their, you know, lose the perch that they're on. They almost always get back again. Of course, that is what they're good at. Now she's going to go inside. Let's see if she does. That is very awesome. And it's amazing. I've even managed to keep my shake under control, which is, that should be recorded for prosperity's sake. Let me put this one down and pick myself another bit of wild rice. But I've been waiting for these, this grass to come about. I've, you're supposed to cook it, but I'm just going to eat it raw. Mm. It doesn't taste like rice. So it tastes a bit like dry rice, but anyway, not really what I brought it up to be. Alrighty, why don't we send you over to Taylor for an update. Oh, oh hello. <laughs> Right, so yes, yeah, through here we've just passed a beautiful airstrip. There were just a couple of impala around here, so we thought we'd carry on and we're going to go and check the dam, the Chitwa Dam, to see if we can find any hippopotami playing about. Or maybe we're going to see some fish eagles, who knows what we're going to see. Could We could get silhouetted fish eagles this evening. We'll have to obviously get to the dam to see if they're around. But I think it's going to be a beautiful evening. We're going to have a perfect clear sunset tonight. There are only a couple of clouds down this side, which is great. So they'll illuminate a little bit later. But let's see what's down here. Cool. So we're not far. We're just going through this dip and then out on the other side is the dam. Whee! Down we go. And I'm surprised as to see how much water is No problem. All right. Sorry, uh, sorry about coming away from Taylor so suddenly like that. You know, these little gremlins in the bush, they sometimes creep into our systems, especially when we're far away from final control. And it happens from time to time, as I'm sure you have seen as well and we also get on top of it very quickly which is also another good thing come with me and come and have a look at this it's one of these true giants again today's been a good day for big trees i must be honest with you we showed you the largest caterpillar pod that i've ever seen this morning and there is the largest leadwood tree that i think is growing on juma at the moment that is a single leadwood tree the base of which is probably easily three or four people wide and just from here, it looks like an absolute giant. Now you can see, at some point, it must have been a much bigger tree. And then it went into a dormant phase, and then has now grown a few branches, a few newer branches, all the ones with the leaves on, in fact, are growing out of the top of the old tree. Now it's very common for leadwood to do that. Leadwood do go dormant sometimes for... Uh, I had a leadwood once when I, I was working at Sabi Sabi. It, it went dormant after my second year of working at Sabi Sabi. And after my ninth year of Sabi Sabi, it had a little branch, one little branch this big was growing from it. They sometimes are fig trees, but in this particular case, it is just the leadwood. Been dormant, now is growing again, was damaged somehow. Just a true giant. They grow anywhere up to 600, 500, 600 years old. So you're looking at one of the ancients of this particular Bushveld. That particular tree is probably in the region of 350 to 500 years old. Can you imagine what it has seen in its 500 years on this planet? It's going to have a... Oh, 
It was just a branch. You know when you're walking around in thick bush like this and things in grass this tall make a noise, you have to look at them. It just becomes one of those things that you have to do. All right. We're not going to be able to get through there, have you? Go this way. Let's see what we can see. Right, what I am going to do is just ask Megan. Megan, if you see our signal dipping a little bit, just tell me and we'll reverse a little bit. This is in thick, thick bush. And we know sometimes in thick bush we lose you. But there's the tree there. Come and have a look at it there. Inside there is as wide as that old giant is. We're not going to risk getting closer. We're going to lose some signal in that area. That is the biggest leadwood on Juma. And on that note, we're going to send you over to Tristan, who's still sitting at the Ahina Den with those two cubs. Thanks, Stefan. That leadwood tree is spectacular if it's the one I'm thinking of. But look at these little ones. Look how brave they're getting. They're coming to explore us and to see who we are and what we are. They came right up to the vehicle, so probably about, I would say, not even 10 feet away from the front of the car and they were having a little sniff and a little look around and now it looks like it's time for a little game they've been running around and are far more energetic than the last time i saw them the last time i saw them all they were doing was having a good feed in the gloominess of the sunset or twilight and so it's nice to see them out and about and playing a little more now poor ribbon is obviously fatigued she's probably been dealing with these two most of the afternoon and so she is just trying to catch a little nap and especially now that the sun has gone away it's going to be perfect for her to have a nice rest it's nice and cool now and here comes trouble again I think one of them starting to come back towards mom is having a little sniff around aren't they the sweetest little things isn't that amazing Right, so we're going to spend a little bit longer with these two little hooligans. And you can actually see that one's spots are starting to come out. And while we do that, let's go across to Taylor, who's got another animal that starts with an H. We've got two baby hippos playing in Chitwa Dam. Look at this, how cool is this? And so close as well. Normally they're always on the other end of the dam and it's always impossible for us to get a good shot. But porpoising around, playing with each other, there's a quite a few females here. And not all the little ones are so happy and jolly as those two. They've obviously got a nice special bond between them. But they're playing on the island at the moment. There's very few spots for these hippos to stand. And I'm sure you know this because the dam is so, so, so deep at the moment. The other day they were all the way around the corner, which was almost impossible for us to see. But I'm so glad that they're here in the corner today, which is really lovely. Now these hippo, I don't know if these are the teeny tiny ones, the, the newborn that we saw. I have seen one other hippo that looks much smaller than these two. I reckon that these guys are a couple of months old. Uh, the other one I'm talking about, Craig, is you see the hippo on the left, mom on the left. She's got a little baby as well that's playing around there but it, it like I said it's not as active no no you won't I don't think you'll be able to see it it's gone underwater again but that one looked like it was teeny 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 tiny but that's okay if we see it again let's watch off two little characters who are pushing each other about at the moment and it is really 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 lucky to see something like this especially to have such a close view of those hippos pushing and shoving each other around it's not a view that you get to see all the time and if you have a look, you can actually see that those hippo are now standing on that bank. There they are. They build up a bit of speed every now and then and charge at each other. Not quite making the big weight that an adult bull can make. And we're just telling Megan's on the wrong way here. Megan, you've just asked me for a link, but I can't link to you because you are already with me. But look at them chasing each other around and they're pushing each other about. So it seems as though we're having a battle of cuteness today. You decide, do you like the hippos or do you like the hyenas? So I'm gonna send you across to Tristan so you can have one more look at those fluffy cubs. Now, 
little ones unfortunately just ran off they were literally a meter from us and they got a little fright unfortunately I don't know if maybe it was the radio that went off that they got a little fright and they ran up towards the mound but they are becoming very very curious oh, it's Ruben just checking around why they ran away and the two of them looks like they're starting to come back so let's see if they're gonna come and be cheeky little naughty monsters again and come and see what we're doing so let's see now they are slowly but surely learning that they we're not something that they need to worry about Ooh, and a big stretch from ribbon I wonder if she's seeing the Sun so low on the horizon that she knows now it's almost time to start getting going now she's going to lie it down right in the road for us and the little ones are coming to investigate now let's see if they come towards us you can just see in the corner of the frame there that's the corner of the car and isn't that amazing look at them a little bit of loving for mom a little grooming aren't these two just the cutest little things play fighting absolutely amazing now this one that's a little bit darker that has less spots on it seems to me the braver of the two I say that and it now runs off but that's the one that keeps creeping closer first before the other one you can see the other one likes to stay very close to mom but isn't this incredible it's so special to spend time with these little things around the den to see how they get curious such naughty little faces as well it's very very sweet to watch them exploring their landscape and you'll probably find that they really haven't done too much exploring every time that I've seen Ribbon here she's always been lying at the hole so I don't think that they've spent too much time running around just yet also every time I've come to the den I've never seen any sign of her lying on the road oh look at that isn't that amazing? <laughs> Isn't that the sweetest little thing you've ever seen? Oh. And this is why I love hyena den sites. It completely just abolishes the myths and all the horror stories about hyenas and it shows the softer side of them that people can actually really connect with and get to see why these are such incredible animals and why being around their den sites is so special. Look at this, look how inquisitive they are. Now they're coming right along to the vehicle. As you can see I'm trying to stay out of the shot but they're sniffing around. They want to see what this big object is and what it's doing here. Oh, little itchy ear as well. This is absolutely amazing. And they're getting braver and braver. It's quite funny. They come and they smell and then they kind of go back to mom when they lose their nerve. But slowly but surely they've come closer and closer this afternoon. And it really is quite amazing to see how quickly the confidence develops. You see there they lose their nerve and they go bounding away a little bit. And then slowly but surely they'll work up the courage to come back again. What have you found? looks like it was trying to pick something up it looks like just to be a stump I don't think there's a bone there sometimes there's little bones lying around I don't think these ones have been eating meat just yet but look at that <laughs> poor ribbon is not going to be getting any sleep she's been climbed all over look at this isn't this amazing right so Taylor says we're having a battle of cuteness. She says she's got cute hippos, but I don't know if anything can be cuter than these two little hooligans playing around together all over mom. But let's go across to Taylor and see if her little hippos are any competition for our hyenas. I definitely think we've got some contenders here. Look at them jumping out of the water splashing about they're really only just gumming each other at the moment they're both so young that they haven't developed their big time oh wow that was a big porpoise look at that shooting themselves out of the water and flopping on one another but you can see as they open their mouths there's nothing in there but much gums <laughs> so i think it would be a good time for them to play rough like this because they aren't going to hurt each other and if you are worried that they are rough this is normal we see it with lion cubs leopard cubs hyenas all the different animals they often push each other and shove each other copying what the adults do and it's important that they learn how to do these things so that one day when they're big and strong and if they're a male they will have good skills to be able to challenge and chase out other territorial bulls 
I think that these two... Oh, <laughs> come on, tell me that that is not cute. Did you see the little wake that they made as well? I'm sure that they'll be chuffed with themselves that they're able to cause such a ruckus. Now the adults are really not bothered too much by them. I think that they are quite happy that the two youngest hippos here, I can't see, and I haven't seen that other little one either, but I think that they may have moved off somewhere very sneakily because all of a sudden the hippos are now starting to disappear. But I'm sure that mom is very happy that those two are keeping each other company. I've seen it before where you have big pods of hippos, but mainly adults, and you'll have one calf and it's always so funny because you see mom is just not in the mood to play and and of course she's got to try and entertain the little one as much as she can but she seems to get much more well bored than these two will but let's see what they get up to again now oh, they're just saying hello but isn't that amazing and like I said it is so close we're not very far we're only about I'd say about 50, no, about 65 yards away from them. So it's not too far at all. It's actually really amazing. Ooh, who's making a noise? Hopefully we're gonna get some cool sounds just now as the sun starts to set with the hippos snorting and doing their their calls. Now Mac who is only 10 years old you want to know how big can a hippo get. So Mac the easiest way to describe the size of a hippopotamus is that if you think of a, a small car not a big one but a, a quite a small car a hippo always reminds me of that type of size. Uh, it doesn't do them much justice when they're sitting in the water like this because half of their bodies are covered but when they come out of the water they are huge. They are longer than two meters at least maybe even a bit more, maybe two and a half meters, and they can weigh, a big bull can weigh at almost four and a half thousand pounds. They can get to over two tons. I'd say the average weight of a female is about one and a half tons. So what's that? About just over 3,000 pounds. So they can get really, really big. But the problem is, like I said, is that when they sit in the water, you really can't see their actual size. And I was shocked by the first time that I ever saw a hippo out of the water and especially one out of the water during the day because at night it's quite dark and it's a little bit difficult to of course see um, but during the day you get a really really a good clear view and you'll see them and they'll walk past the cars and they're almost as, length, as long as the entire car which is quite amazing. We're not going to be able to stay here for too much longer unfortunately just because they are setting up a sundowner in the distance. Now Tammy, you're wondering how long before these young hippos will not need to depend on their mothers. It, it depends, so these guys, it's hard to tell because of the, I can't see how big they are with them being in the water. But I suspect that they're a couple of months old. I really can't even see too many teeth developing there. And I would say for the first two years of a hippo's life, They'll be suckling and they'll be uh, or drink, dr obviously drinking milk from mom, but they learn, they start grazing too. So even, even these two now, remember I told that story the other day of a hippopotamus that mom died and it was quite young and it managed to survive on its own. And these animals are quite resilient too. So I think after about a year and a half, you'll be surprised and they might be able to survive on their own. In this area, it would be very tricky though, because there are a lot of predators so lions, hyenas, they would uh, of course try and snatch up a young hippo calf. But we're going to have to leave just now because I think uh, that some guests are coming to have a surprise sundowner and watch all the hippos play about. So we'll let them do it in peace. But let's go back to those hyenas. And I'm so glad that they're getting brave. Well, not only are they getting brave, but they're getting quite boisterous too. Look at these little ones pulling at each other and fighting. And this is all over milk. They're disturbing the peace. Whoopsie. <laughs> Oops. So one of them has lost the mind. They're going crazy. It's game time now. I think that they know that it's almost bedtime. And so this is typical of little children. You know when it's bedtime, things go out of control. There's playing and there's running and there's shouting and there's carrying on like hooligans before they get put into their bed. And I think that's a little bit of what we've got going here. But look at how even already at this age, there's this fighting style that they have. They 
drop their bums down, they turn their head and they kind of bite backwards and try and grab each other like that. So they're already practicing those techniques that they're going to use later in life. Oopsie! Now, I know hippos can be cute, but I don't think anything can be as cute as these two have been this afternoon. They have been very, very, very entertaining. I just love all the noises as well as they... Matt A10, you reckon the hyenas are cuter than the hippos? I agree. I reckon these are... Ah, Matt Age 10. Sorry, Megan. The comms are a little bit scratchy where I am. But Age 10, Matt, you... I agree. The hyenas are very cute, aren't they? They're like little puppies. The hippos, while they are cute and they do play a lot, the hyenas just have that puppy feel, which I suppose is a little bit closer to home, and that's why we tend to be endeared towards these little ones. They're very, very sweet. So, Michael, this is an interesting question. You're wondering whether it's possible to sex them now that they are so close. Well, Michael, I suppose we could if we looked, but even when they are born, the male and females, the males, I mean, the female still develops those fake male scrotum and, and genitals, and so it is quite tough. You've got to kind of wait until you can see their penis and be able to see whether it's either straight, which would be a female, or if it has a sort of protrusion on the end, which is the male. So I was looking at them just now. It looks like one is definitely a male. Um, the other one I can't tell just yet, but it looks like one of them is the male, and that's the one that's got more spots. So the one that is closest to us currently now, that one looks like a little male, but I can't be certain just yet. I think we're going to have to give it a few more weeks until we can be 100% certain which is which and whether or not they're male or female, but it does look like one little male at least. So, Reese, you're wondering at what age will Ribbon's cubs leave the den for good? Well, in all likelihood, Reese, they'll probably leave the den between sort of seven and nine months. So eight months is a kind of number that we use but it's obviously like anything in the wild is a little bit dependent on the individual so anywhere between seven and nine months i've even seen hyenas as old as 12 months still quite bound to the den site but they do go on nightly forays and then they come back to the den site during the day when the adults are back and suckling their little ones oh when life gets too hard just flop down and roll onto your back isn't that amazing that's so cool That's amazing. We have been absolutely spoiled this afternoon. So yeah, they do probably around eight months is what I would reckon that they're going to be start going out and exploring even during the night and not be net den bound with mom. Now look at this little one. Let's see if it'll come up close. You can see it's right, right here. So I'm going to try just get out of the shot a little bit. It is very, very close to us. Isn't that amazing? That really is so, so special. Like I said, that little one that's a little bit darker seems to be the braver one. That's the one that keeps coming up to us and seeing what we are. And let's do a bit of mountain climbing and climb over the top of Mom. Alright guys, so it is starting to get quite dark and gloomy which means that we cannot leave our good friend Steph out in the wilds on foot. So I think we're going to go across to him so he can say his goodbyes, and then we're going to come right back to the hyenas and see if these little ones will carry on playing for us. And not only are we going to say goodbye, we're also going to say goodbye with the giraffe. Today has been a big day, well this afternoon, Sunset Safari has been a big day for big things for us on bushwalk, a big herd of elephant, a big male elephant, and our big bull giraffe. Isn't that nice to see? Just to give you some idea of scale, I could stand up straight underneath his belly. That's how much bigger that giraffe is than I am. Isn't that incredible? He's in such good condition. Just look at those massive four legs, those shoulders. They're used to punch and box one another with. With thick neck, his head almost looks too small for his body. 
And that's because his body is in such fantastic condition. This is a bull giraffe in his prime. Huge hindquarters, healthy looking skin, just in really pristine condition. And that's simply because of the diet that he's had recently over the last couple of months. The leaf cover has been exceptional this year. And I think he's just put on a lot of weight and he's just at that right age where it matters. Isn't that nice? All right, we are very far away from home. We are going to have to march now. So not only is it getting dark and gloomy, like Tristan said, but it's also probably about two miles or so for, for us to get back. So we're going to be marching and we're going to need to get there before it gets too dark for us to be out in the dark. Cool. Anyway, that's uh, us for today. Thank you very much for joining us on Safari. You going back to Tristan. We'll catch up with you tomorrow. I'm glad Steph's on his way back, even though he is the Bear Grylls of South Africa and could probably karate chop anything that came his way with one pinky finger. It is better that he gets back into the safety of camp. He goes and puts his feet up a bit. Our fearless leader has been working quite hard over the last few weeks, so we don't want to tire him out too much. Now, talking about tiring themselves out, I think these little ones, as much as they run around, they also need the nutrients to be able to sustain this hive of activity that they've been displaying this afternoon and so it's now back to a little drink and like I was saying because the light is starting to fade I reckon that this is going to be their last little suckle before mom starts putting them to bed it's unfortunately when it starts to go dark they then get put into the hole and it's time for them to sleep and to rest but you can see I always laugh at hyenas there's two teats there that they can suckle from but it's typical with siblings, and I know this is how I was with my brother. If he has something, then you have to have it too. So you can't share different things, but you, or sorry, use different things. You have to share the same thing. And so there's this fighting that goes on over the same things. So it's just like naughty children that get comp competitive over the smallest stuff. It looks like mom has sorted it out with a little leg flick there. And now both of them are on two different teats and both happy suckling now. So Daniel, we were talking a little bit earlier about the age that they leave the den and you're wondering at what age they'll join Ribbon on foraging patrols or hunting patrols. Well, I suppose it's dependent. At eight months they're probably a little bit still too small to participate in the robbing of lions, let's say, of a, of a kill, or even the competitive nature of leopards, um, the kills. But in terms of the hunting, they would probably still be sort of observers at eight months. So generally, from my experience and what I've seen in this area, about a year and a half is when they actually start being quite active in terms of foraging and scavenging. And then about two years when they can actually start bullying other predators and start really taking over from other predators' um, food items. So it takes a while until they can do that. For the From eight months to about a year and a half, they're just learning. They watch what the clan gets up to and they see what goes on. And they're also growing at that stage. So they're just getting the size that's going to be needed to be able to take on the big apex predators of Africa in the form of lions and leopard. So until then... It's more a student program. It's like going to college. They get kicked out of the house, but they have to go and learn their trade before they get older. Ooh, take care. This is an interesting one. I'm actually not sure what the answer to this is, but you're wondering how much milk they drink daily. Now, I actually don't know. I would have to hazard a guess. I would say... No. Hmm probably say that they're drinking I would say probably between 500 mils and a liter a day I don't know maybe somewhere around there I'll try and investigate and see maybe some of you out there know you can send through your answers to hashtag at Safari Live and let us know what you think but I would imagine somewhere around there maybe a little bit more than that given that they are growing now and their bellies always look to be so full at this age it seems like they never stop suckling but I would say about 500 mils that would be my guess but I could be completely wrong. But 
Isn't that amazing? It's incredible to actually see the difference between the two of them already. So even though they're born at the same time, the fact that one is still so much darker than the other is quite amazing. You can see those little eyes are just open, although they're getting heavier and heavier. Ah, so Taylor has also been listening in to our conversation about milk and she was saying that hyena milk is incredibly nutrient rich and that they can go a week without the milk which I did know but I, she also is not sure how much they actually can take in on a day and I think it's obviously dependent also on the female as to how much milk she's producing whether or not she's been eating correctly and has got a lot of nutrients in her milk because the less she eats the less nutrient rich the milk will be that she produces so I think there's a lot of factors involved um, and the less nutrient rich I would imagine the more milk they actually try to take on but I'll try and do some research and see what we can find out and see what they actually consume now I'm just thinking about sort of normal dogs and cats and how much you would generally feed them as little ones so oh, very feisty this evening Claire you're wondering if the hyena's tongue is rough like a cat or smooth like a dog well clear I can tell you that I've never actually physically felt a hyena tongue and from my general sort of dealings with hyenas and watching them up close on carcasses when they lick a carcass you definitely do not get that same kind of sandpapery sound that you get when a cat licks a carcass so it doesn't sound the same so I would imagine that they are more like dogs in that way and that their tongue is a little bit smoother and I've also never noticed when a hyena yawns those big um, sort of backward facing claw like structures that the cats have on their tongues so I don't think so but I might be wrong I have never ever heard that sound or actually even seen them utilize their tongues like a cat will to lick off things they normally chew and try and crunch and, and swallow big chunks then to actually lick and get rid of anything Well, Shannon, you're all the way from the Ohio, and you want to know how many litters this hyena can have in a year. Well, just one, Shannon. So she's going to have this little one, and then she's going to nurse it for the next eight months. And then from there, the little ones start to kind of move around with her, and she teaches them what's going on for the next couple of months. And she'll only really start breeding in about a year's time, year and a half's time. So it's only once a year that she has little ones. Even though she has a very short gestation period, it's quite a long suckling period. And it's like most predators. Most predators, their gestation periods are very, very short because they try and get rid of the little ones as quick as possible because the little ones take a lot of space, slow them down, which means that they really struggle to hunt. And so they try to get the little babies out as quick as possible. And often the babies are born very underdeveloped. And it means that they've got to suckle them and look after them in den sites for long periods of time until they're strong enough and big enough to be able to move around. Also when you're a predator, and particularly a hyena, you've got to fight a lot with other predators, and so you need to grow and get a little bit bigger before you can start venturing out into the world and start fighting with others. And that's why they are den bound for so long, and why she only has a litter every, I'd say it's probably a year and a half to two years between litters. It also depends on the females, so the higher ranking females tend to put out more. Bobby, since we're looking at the little ones, and you see that there are two of them you're wondering how many are born to a hyena at once and just remember Bobby that these are not pups they are called cubs so baby hyenas are cubs they are not puppies and um, they are only ever as many as two sometimes you'll see one and that sometimes can be because of siblicide where two females are born and one female kills the other one out of competitive streak 
but generally if they have the most they can have is two at a time. They only have two teeth, so anything more than that would be too much competition and they wouldn't be able to feed themselves. So she only has two, but you'll find their first couple litters, often it's only just the one by itself. And then again, when they get very, very old, they tend to only produce one. It's very similar to leopards actually, and then lions, their litter sizes get bigger during their prime years and then start to fade off as they start to get a little bit older. Oh, look at that, being groomed a little bit. So, Aaron, this is quite a pertinent question, because actually, if you look at the back there, you can see the one is starting to show its spots, so you don't want to know what age the spots start to show. Well, generally, the spots to show now are about six to eight weeks old, is when you start to see the spots coming out, and by the time they reach about seven, eight months, spots are completely out and all the black is gone so you can already see the one at the back which unfortunately now is laid down its spots are starting to show quite e quite a lot and this little one on its shoulder there you can see the first of the little spots starting to show so there's a little spot it's its first one as far as I can see and there's a couple of others that are darkening within that dark fur and slowly but surely that fur is going to come out and you're going to start seeing those spots developing but at about eight months the the metamorphosis is complete and they become the spotted hyenas like ribbon. But you can see how alert she is, how she's listening all the time. She knows now is the time of the day when all the daylight animals are going to sleep. The nocturnals are starting to come out. She might start hearing her clan calling in the distance. So she's just listening and using those big satellite-like ears to be able to hear what's going on. She also seems to be listening to my voice. Hello ribbon, how are you? I think it's more the fact that we're just sitting behind her and she's intrigued by this big vehicle. Right, so what I think is because it's getting very dark now and I don't want to put lights on these little ones, we're actually going to leave them alone. They've absolutely spoiled us this afternoon. So I think it's time for us to leave them and let them do their own thing and let the babies go to bed. And while we do that, let's go across to Taylor and see what she's going to be looking for in the twilight hours. Well, Tristan, I'm so glad that you've had such an incredible hyena sighting. I'm jealous. And exciting also to see the habituation process really starting to show now with those cubs. We are after some big cats. So we're going... <clears throat> I had to swallow that bug. That one went in and hit, I think, my tonsils. No spitting that one out, sir. No need for dinner tonight. The bugs are horrendous this evening also. I've had to drive around with my sunglasses on because they keep getting in my eyes. So I'm going to drive just like this. What do you think? Craig, you'll have to tell me when I need to turn. Anyway, so we're going to go look and follow up on the Birmingham boys who apparently Andrew had left them about half an hour ago. He says they were still resting up in, this, in a similar spot to where they were this morning. I think they'd obviously move a little bit just chasing the shade. So we're just putting foot a bit because this is the time of the day that of course the lions are going to get active and all the, not the predators are going to start to move around. And I'm just hoping that we don't lose them because it's quite a big block if they do start moving sort of uh, west. We could lose them quite easily. So hence my Ferrari safari this afternoon. And we shall just keep this pace going just until we get there. We're not far, we're almost at at Sandy Patch now. Maybe we even catch them already up and moving around. Who knows? Oh, hang on. Let me get that again. Okay, we're coming up to Impala Plains now. Ah, there we go. Erica from France, as we make our way towards these lions, you're wondering if if uh, lions use any strategies while hunting. They do indeed. I've seen a variety of different types of strategies, so most of the time you, it's the females that do the hunting, except 
when you're in an area like this where there's long grass, there's lots of shrubs to hide behind, then of course the males can definitely partake. If you're in an area where it's sort of quite sort of desert-like or quite arid where there's not much grass, not much shrubbery to hide behind, it becomes a lot more difficult for the boys to hunt. But the males are very important for helping when it comes to bringing down big prey because they're much stronger than the girls. And the quicker the lions can get an animal down onto the ground off of its feet, uh, the better chance that they have, of course, of being a successful takedown. And also they run the risk of injuring themselves. While that animal is on its feet, it's, uh, it's going to be a bit of a problem. But yes, they do use different techniques. My goodness, there are so many different types. Let's go up here. So a lot of the time, uh, you'll get the, the females, of course, are doing... Okay, wait, you know what we'll do? Tristan's just spotted some elephants. The sun is about to go down. So I'll continue and I'll finish telling you about the hunting techniques of lions when we find the Birminghams. But let's go across to uh, Tristan and have a last look at the giants of Africa. Indeed, Taylor, I'd be quite interested to hear about your hunting techniques and I wish you good luck on your search for the Birmingham boys. I hope it's far better than our luck was. Although we can't complain this afternoon, we have this spectacular elephant sighting now to top off our incredible hyena sighting that we had this afternoon. And you can see that this breeding herd is just coming out of the drainage thickets where they probably spent the day because it was much cooler. And they're now coming out into these grassland areas where they're starting to make use of the heavily seeded grass that we see at the moment. And they are under the most spectacular sky. We've got these fingers of light that are coming over the western boundary that are these deep sort of maroons and purples into this deep blue evening sky and it is absolutely incredible. So I'm hoping that this herd is going to move a little bit for us because they're going to go into a more open section where we'll be able to get that light and this herd together a little bit better. But it seems like quite a small breeding herd. There's a number of little ones involved as well, which is quite nice to see. It's always good when we have lots of Ellie's around. I really love a good elephant herd. They always seem to be up to something. And that's probably what Ribbon and the little cubs were listening to. When we were back there, we kept seeing them pop their heads up. And this elephant herd has just come along the edge of that hyena den and now they're coming around. So that's probably what Ribbon was listening to and why she was so alert all the time. She was hearing the cracking of branches and the breaking of leaves and, and that's the reason she was so interested in what was going on. Now, like I say, I'm hoping these elephants are going to come underneath all the marulas here because it is spectacular. The light that is coming from this side. Hello little ones. Oh, there's a tiny little baby here. See it? And there comes another one as well. So we've got two little babies. Now, these little ones, particularly for this female that's... So, Bobby, you're wondering whether the females have tusks too. Well, if you look at this elephant that's just over here, the one at the back, you can see the little trunk that it was sticking up trying to suckle off its mom and you can see that that female does indeed have tusks so yes the females do have tusks although lately we've started to notice an increased number of females with no tusks so they think it is a genetic response to hunting incidents and also because the tusk is becoming vestigial on a female the females only really use it for getting bark and breaking roots they don't use it for defense and so they're not using it nearly as much as what the males are and that's why their tusks are getting thinner and smaller and why even some of them are evolving having no tusks whatsoever but yes females and males alike do present tusks and look at that little baby off to the side trying to have a little drink isn't that incredible so Drew this is a very pertinent question given that we are chatting about tusks and whether females have them you want to know what these elephants use them for well they use them for a multitude of different things you'll find oh, itchy ear and um, the they'll use them a lot for feeding so they will get that tusk and go up to a tree and they push their tusk into the bark of a tree and then break off bits of it and they feed off that bark they'll also use it to leverage a branch so maybe with this female we'll see it if she can't break the branch then sometimes she'll put it over her tusk and lift her head and that acts as a leverage point that can then crack 
the branch and she can peel it off. They also use it to dig up roots. So you'll find they put the head down to the ground and they dig up these roots that are buried underneath and pull them up with their trunk. And then they will also use them to defend themselves and to establish dominance in the males. So the males will lock tusks together and push one another around and they will attack any potential threat with those tusks as well. Right, so while we sit and admire these gentle giants under a beautiful maroon and blue sky, I think it's perfect that we go across to Taylor who's success successfully completed a hunting technique of her own and has managed to find the Birmingham boys. But before I even show you the Birminghams, how stunning is the sky? Isn't that incredible? Look at those beautiful lights. It's almost as if somebody is shining a strobe into the sky. Let's just take a moment, I think, just to appreciate the sounds of the birds as they give one last call before the sun sets. It's a very, very peaceful scene at the moment. Mr. Mfumo, I think it is Mfumo, that has got his head up. Or it could actually be Tinio. Now I can't tell. In this dim light, let's see, it does look like there's a bit of a scar, but now I cannot tell. This is always so difficult. Turn your head completely and look at me, please, Mr. Lion, so I can see your entire face. But anyways, all three of them are still here, which is good to know. We'll work out the dynamics in a moment when they all decide to show us their faces. But they seem to be resting and fast asleep. So hopefully all it takes is just one lion to do a couple of big yawns and then wake up. And hopefully he'll go and greet the rest of his brothers and, and will encourage them to wake up as well. But it is so, so, so quiet out here as you heard a moment ago. Now I said to Craig, what would absolutely make my day is to have these three Birminghams doing a full roar six feet away from the car. That would be unbelievable. I don't know when I last heard more than two lions roaring at once. It's been quite a while. I think the last time I had it was when the entire Southern Pride and the Charleston uh, male lions. Oh, hang on big yawn. I think let's keep watching these boys because hopefully once we get one yawn we're going to get many more and it's always nice to see down a lion's throat and particularly to see their beautiful teeth. So yes that would be my wish for this evening on St. Patrick's Day is to have the three Birminghams do a beautiful roar for all of us and I kid you not Craig will have to hold on to that camera. This vehicle will be vibrating so much if that's the case. Now we've just got the two here at the moment and um, the other Birmingham is just laying out of sight just underneath the long grass. Come on guys, we're getting, we're getting closer and closer to these boys waking up. Oh, this looks like it is Tinio. Yes, this looks like Tinio. Fumo has got that massive scar on his eye and I thought I did see a scar just off of the left of his face where he lost a canine. He wants to yawn again, but isn't this just beautiful? Now we were lucky this morning just to catch them moving around slightly and getting up and repositioning before they settled in for the day. So hopefully we get the same thing this evening, but just in reverse, having them wake up and then groom themselves, do big yawns, stand up, do a big roar, and then we can go home. <laughs> That's how I'm hoping that it's going to go this evening. So if you do have any questions for us, remember hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. But I have to go back to a question uh, that Erica was asking about uh, lions hunting and if there's any sort of thought process behind it or any strategies that are used. So I'll tell you a really cool story. The one day I sat and watched lions, I kid you not, for about three hours. We were, I was out for ages with these guests. I had three gentlemen on my vehicle 
and it's actually quite a funny story and I had them for about four or five nights we did all sorts of exciting things but they said they really wanted to watch a lion kill so I said we've got to sit with the lions the whole afternoon to the evening if we want to stand a chance and that's what you've got to do with these animals so sitting watching the lions and eventually they started waking up just as these guys are now they then walk towards a herd of bless bok which is an antelope species and chase them around but they weren't really stalking them they're just sort of walking towards them in a line and it was amazing so these bushbuck bush these bless bok kept running there were a couple of impalas scattered between two and they chased them to an area almost like this where the grass was really long and it was open and it was the most spectacular thing then the pride split it was just two females and two males that were actually the one the part of the pride that we were watching. The rest of the pride was missing in action. And one male and one female uh, stayed sitting much, pretty much right in front of my car, sitting up looking at the, at the bless book. And the other two, the other male and the other female, ducked off to the right and sort of stalked very low in the grass. We couldn't see where they'd gone, but we knew that they went sort of a little bit further east. So we sat and we sat and we sat for 45 minutes in the darkness. And I just quickly popped my lights on, my, my spotlight on, to have a quick scan around. Nothing. And the next minute I heard an impala snort. And as it snorted, I put my spotlight on again. And we saw that the male and female lion that had snuck off actually sat up in the long grass and exposed themselves. And then as they did that, of course, the impala, the bless book, it was a complete frenzy. They started running in the opposite direction. And as this was going on, the male and female that were sitting right in front of my car had sort of uh, panned all the way across to the left-hand side, further towards uh, the northwest, where they then waited and sat down in the long grass as the, the impala and the bless book were running towards them. The next minute... The male stands up in the middle of the grass and so does the female as these, uh, as these impala and bless book are running past them and they both snatched an entire bless book each. So that was really incredible the way that they'd worked that out. And then you see different types of strategies. Often in prides you'll have one lioness that they call the runner, which is often the fastest lioness. How they figure it out between them, I'm not sure if they have lion races, you know, on your marks, get set, go, or who decides on who's the fastest lion, but you'll have that one chasing and you'll have others strategically placed out in, a sp in an area and uh, that lioness will try and chase the prey uh, directly towards the other members uh, and then of course then they also just stalk right up and as close as they can get to their prey too but there's many many different types of strategies come on boys wake up now you're doing a good job you're giving us a couple of yawns you're now grooming yourself quite vigorously and so hopefully they're going to be up soon. So I, I think that this isn't... Let me turn that down. Now, I think that these two, it's Tenyon and Fumo. They seem to have a strong bond. And Nena, I think, is lying just off on his own. Now, Shana, you, you are wondering, and your thought is correct. Just you've said, weren't there five Birmingham boys when they started? 100%. They were indeed. But unfortunately, one had a nasty run-in with a buffalo and then didn't make it after it sustained some sort of fatal injuries, uh, which was quite sad. But it was natural and sometimes the prey gets the best of you too. And, and that's what happens. And that's the thing that we say, Archers, in the summer months, when, once the buffalo have recovered from the harsh winters or the droughts like we've had, there is very few things that can stop a big buffalo bull or even an entire herd. They are big and we've seen a couple of massive dugger boys at the moment and uh, who are you know, definitely uh, much heavier than what they were during the drought. I just want to call the sighting in very quickly on the radio. Let me do that because so I can hear some talking. Okay, no. Unlock with the three Birmingham boys in the same spot just between Buffalo's Hook, Cut Line, and Sandy Patch. Space for two. Uh, you're say, slowly starting to wake up. A couple of yawns, but now they've gone back down again. I'll keep you updated. 
There you go. So just chatting to the guys because I think they've all been seeing flat cats at the moment and nobody likes to see a flat cat. They prefer to see these three big boys in action. Well, they don't look like they're going anywhere just yet. So we're going to sit here for a bit longer and wait for them to wake up. But in the meantime, I'm going to send you back across to Tristan and see if he's going to find some weird creatures of the night. Weird creatures of the night, Taylor McCurdy. What exactly would that be? I'm interested to know what you think I should be finding. Hopefully I will not be finding any human weird creatures in the night because that would be a bit disconcerting. But I suppose weird would be... What's the most weird creature we have out? Aardvark? Solifuge. You reckon Solifuge is the weird? Alien. Fair enough. Oh, we, there's a bronze wing corsa, which is not weird at the moment. Those are about the most common bird we see it in the evenings. Um, Ardfark, weird, Dot? That's pretty weird. Pretty weird. Mm, what else is quite weird out here at night? Hmm, I'm just trying to think. There's no very obvious weird things that come to bat. There's those slits. Bats, but we don't actually get them here. But if you go into the internet and go look up slit face bats, they look quite weird. Um, maybe I'll bump into hmm, what else? Interesting. Just trying find to think what else. Ah, talking about weird and wonderful. Can you see that? I think they've just jumped off. Can you see there? There's somewhere in that little thicket. So in that natural archway, just underneath the archway, is where I could see their eyes. So somewhere in there. Where are you? There we go. Just a little bit tighter in there, Dave. Somewhere on those branches. Uh, yeah, in the back on that knob thorn. But I can't see where they've gone now. But there was two of them there. There we go. It's just going up the branch. Uh, where have you gone now? Maybe just... There, you can just see them moving in that little gap right there. So, that is the bush baby, right? You can just see its tail moving around there. There we go. Little face. So, this appears to be two of them. Now, I know Taylor last week had a sighting of bush babies with little babies. Well, actually, that was this week, should I say. Now I wonder if we're in the same area that she was in. Because it looks like a pair of them. But isn't that the cutest little face? Now that's a weird looking creature. And they've got these big eyes. They remind me of that movie um, Gremlins. That's what they remind me of. But look at them. I love how they move around. They're such energetic little characters. They tend to have these explosive jumps. Oh, where am I going? There we go. And it seems like they've gone into that thicket there. And they're just bouncing away. Well, that was nice. That's a good start to our finds of the evening. Now, I'm going to try and see if we can get through here. It's, we are going to go through a little bit of a little area. So, we might have to go across Taylor and flat Birmingham's. Now, I hope they roll for her because it's an incredible sign. And it's I see if I could find, but tailor that privilege on St. Patrick's Day. So let's go and see if there's bearing and just wake. We are sitting and waiting for the lions to, of course, wake up, which they are not doing, which is very disappointing. Come on now, lions. This is absolute nonsense. You've had enough time to sleep, and they tricked me. This is not April Fool's Day, it's not the type of day to just start yawning and grooming yourself and then go back to sleep again. But I'm also not surprised because these three male lions like to do the least amount of work I've ever seen. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else agrees with me and I love the Birminghams and I think that they're wonderful. However, they're not the most active cats. Even when they go on territorial patrols, they always just look like, oh, life is so tough. Why do I really have to go out and do this? Can't somebody else do it for me? That's how I always think. 
well, that's what I think is going on in the Birmingham's minds. Whereas other male lions, and, and I know lions have a stigma attached to them, they are lazy. But I, most of the boys I've seen are always so active and moving around and marking territories, making sure nobody's coming into their areas. And it, it seems as though these boys only like to do their patrols at 2 o'clock in the morning. So they snooze for as absolutely long as they can. And then the last bit of darkness in the morning, uh, they well, they seem to, of course, just go back to sleep or do their work and then go back to sleep for the rest of the day. I think that's what's going to happen here. Now, Aaron, you're wondering if lions hunt during the day and the night. They do indeed, especially in this area. It's actually quite easy for them at the moment in summer. Like I said, there's plenty of coverage in terms of vegetation around at the moment. So it does make it slightly easier and they tend to have a better chance of getting closer to their prey because the closer they get, the, the better they have of bringing an animal down. When they've got to run longer distances, they tend to run out of stamina and they become exhausted and then that doesn't work too well from them. And I've seen lions catching wildebeest during the day, zebra during the day, impala, blessbok, you name it. And at night I've seen them taking down lots of buffalo, kudu, zebra, again, you name it. Very, very different types of animals. And with moms, with, uh, with lionesses that have got cubs, young cubs, especially if they still haven't been introduced to the pride and they're off in a den site somewhere, you'll find that she'll go out very much like Karula does, the leopard, and uh, hunts during the day too when the other predators aren't as active. So she tries to move in between those, those sort of times of the day, which is really quite nice and quite clever. Now, another question from Aaron, you, you've now asked if male lions typically hunt together. Well, it depends. These boys will, because as you see at the moment, they're not with the Nkuhuma pride. So if they are hungry and they, they're not fat at the moment, from what we saw this morning, they definitely could eat. Some of their, their hips are showing. Uh, they're still all right. They'll be okay for another day or two, though. And if they go out now on a territorial patrol, which I'm sure they will a bit later when, when they decide to get up, and they come across something, it could be anything, a buffalo, a zebra, a wildebeest, an impala, you name it, they will try and take it down. And particularly good male lions that I've seen hunting very well and together separated from the pride is actually the Charleston males. And I talk a lot about them just because I spent so much time with them. They were phenomenal. The two of them would uh, they'd be together and then they'd often split up too and go their own ways. And on some mornings you'd come across with a Charleston with the tooth that's hanging out of his mouth. They got kicked out by a giraffe or as they say. And uh, he, he was on a buffalo kill once, twice, three or four times. I've seen him on his own with a buffalo kill. And whether it was because it was winter and the animals were weakened, that definitely plays a role which obviously helped him but male lions are very well capable on their own or together on taking down prey they're not bad hunters some it's just like with with genetics some lions male or female may be better off than others some lions and leopards may be better mothers than others it you know it's just that type of thing we see it in in nature all the time but hunting these boys I don't know, I've yet to find the three of them, or the four of them, on, a, on their own kill. Every time I've ever seen the Birminghams on a kill, they've always joined the Nguhumas, who we know are very, very successful hunters. They do a sterling job, but it's tough now. Tough pickings at the moment. So hopefully we're going to get the big herds of buffalo coming back soon. Uh, or, and when I say big, I don't know if we get masses... Oh, did you... <laughs> Did you hear that big stretch and groan from from Tino? That was very funny. Come on now, wake up. Here we go, another stretch. Maybe we'll get lucky this time round. I'm also not holding my breath though. Now, Alfonso, good evening to you and thank you for your question. You've asked on this fine summer's evening if lions will mate with their siblings or, here we go, come on, do a roll over, come on, do a big yawn. They're rolling over again. Let's watch the, oh no, never mind, now they've gone back down again. 
oh, I thought we were going to get lucky and see another big yawn. Or, or if they mate with their sort of siblings or any other members in the pride. They do. Incest is completely normal, but normally it weans itself out. So these Birmingham boys are not going to be the dominant males in the pride of, or in this particular area forever. It'll last a couple of years. If they're lucky, they'll get three or four years out of it. Maybe if they become exceptionally successful and there are no bigger coalitions of young males pushing in, it might even be for a bit longer. They could be here to about 10 years old, but that's quite old for a male to still be holding a, a very popular territory like this particular area. So, uh, so it happens for a couple of times and uh, normally it's okay for two or three times to have the sort of incest coming through and, and it's not a problem. I mean, look at Hosanna and Shongile the other evening. We did have a school drive though and I couldn't quite talk about the mating uh, that goes on between the cats because they were young children. They were only about five years old. So I made a joke and said that they were wrestling. But Hosanna, from natural instinct, pounced onto Shongile, grabbed her on the, by the scruff of the neck and actually started. Uh, mating with her. I don't think he wasn't very successful, but he's getting the motions right, and Shongile didn't seem to be bothered by it at all. So it just shows you that type of thing is completely normal out here. It's not frowned upon. They don't know any difference at all, but it doesn't last for a long time, thankfully. Otherwise, after a couple of generations, three or four generations, you are going to see a lot of uh, uh, deformities, which is not great, so we don't really want that. But oh, I'm wondering if we should hold our breaths and hang with these Birmingham boys. They're starting to make me a little bit sad now. Wake up, lions, wake up. But we'll give it a go. I haven't sat with sleeping cats for a while, so for all of you, I will do it. But let's hop on board in the meantime with Tristan and see if we can issue him a bush baby challenge. A bush baby challenge. Well, Taylor, if you're holding your breath to see if the lions are going to get moving, I don't think there'll be much of a challenge. I think you might no longer whisper and make fire from lack of breathing. So rather don't hold your breath. One thing about the Birminghams is that they know how to sleep. I have sat for many, many an hour of my life with the Birmingham boys and seen not the slightest hint of movement. I actually remember at one point, I think I had been six weeks and we had had the Birminghams quite a bit at that stage and I had seen them in the six week cycle that I worked I reckon probably 15, 16 times and in that 15, 16 times I never saw one Birmingham walk, not once. They just lay flat every single time. I had them head up once or twice but otherwise they lay down. So those boys do know how to have a good powerful long days rest so hopefully Taylor will not expire and we'll go back to her vehicle where she's still chatting and not slumped over her steering wheel but bush baby challenge I think we can do that Taylor I think that's a fair call it's 2-0 as of this evening and we can't count your ones from the other day just because you had the little babies in sight that doesn't get bonus points we're starting from tonight so two zip so far and we shall see who has the most bush babies by the end of the evening now, the other one that I was thinking about that we could use was courses, but then I remembered that courses are a dime a dozen, and so I will struggle to actually keep count of that many birds, because I probably think we've already seen about 15 tonight on our travels, so I don't think I'm going to try and look for any others. Ah, Aaron, you want to know how big bush babies are, so I mean to stop the car so that I can actually show you because it will be able to give you a better reference. Now if you take my pair of binoculars here, which are about, you can see against my hand, that is about the size of a bush baby without the tail, so that would be from the head to the backside and then the tail will come out, but that's the size of the lesser bush baby. The bigger one, or the greater bush baby, probably is about that size. So it's quite big and round and fat and fluffy with a much longer tail. It's called a thick-tailed bush baby or greater galago, and they are slightly larger. So that's about the size of them. The little ones are incredibly cute and very, very small. And that's why they're so challenging to actually get on camera is because not only are they small, but they also are hyperactive. They're like our little hyena cubs from this afternoon and they bounce around all over the place and their movement is not very smooth and fluid like most animals. They have this kind of hydraulic explosive shot 
into the darkness and so it really is quite tough to keep the light on them and follow where they've gone you end up feeling like you're a bit of a crazy person bouncing with your light all over the place which is quite something maybe that's why Taylor's so good at it because she's so jumpy and bouncy and bubbly herself that she's able to bounce around with the bush babies and keep them in the light a lot better than the rest of us well we shall see tonight if that is the case actually oh I just swallowed an insect that wasn't very pleasant yeah bit of protein for the night Dave Ugh. oh well nothing that can be done when you're driving and the insect is flying the opposite direction it tends to go way down the hatch anyway so not much more that you can do than other just then just hope that you don't taste anything and it wasn't a big fly seemed to be a small one so I'm sure I'll be okay luckily it wasn't a stink bug otherwise I would have been coughing and spluttering because they do taste quite foul they're terrible when you have dinners at night and especially if you have light often they attract to the light and then they land in your food and you're busy enjoying your meal and sometimes it can be a beautiful big steak and you eating your juicy steak and it's very very nice and all of a sudden you get that familiar taste of stink bug and they are these tiny little black bugs that you can't see in the dingy light if you're having like a dinner out in the bush or in a boma which some of the lodges do and you get this telltale taste and it just puts you off your whole meal which is quite unpleasant sorry I've just spotted some excrement from what I think is a cat so I just want to check quickly hmm indeed not very fresh though so it's quite old I shall reverse back so that Dave can show it to you but there we go so it looks like from a leopard that would be my guess but as you can see around that general area that there is very little track evidence because of the amount of vehicles also that dung is very very dry at this stage so not from this evening which is a great pity I would have loved to have bumped into a leopard this evening it would have been very very nice right while we carry on looking around and continuing our bush baby challenge let's go across to our competitor and see if she's still breathing or if the Birmingham's have actually decided to wake up Craig has actually just mentioned Tristan that it sounds like one of the Birmingham's is dying of course he's not so don't be alarmed it's just the deep breaths that Tinyo is taking. Oh, bless you, big boy. And in amongst his deep breaths and his sneezing, it, he's creating some bizarre noises. But Tristan, you're quite right in saying that. I think I agree with you. And I said earlier, I think that the Birmingham's are the, some of the laziest lions I've ever come across. They never seem to be moving about. They're always doing as little as possible. But... Birmingham boys, let me tell you, you can redeem yourself tonight and one night only and this this is a special, it's lasting for the next eight minutes. If you do a big roar by the time the show ends, I will forgive you and I will take back everything I've said about you being lazy, I can promise you this and I will only sing, sing praises about uh, all the three of you. Nena? You haven't got much to say either. He's just laying in the grass. I haven't seen him even turn over once. So I don't think that he's ready to wake up anytime soon either. Come on now, boys. Do us this favor. Now, as we sit here in the complete darkness, other than the light coming from our vehicles and the twinkle from the stars, Aaron, you're wondering how long do male lions typically live for? It's actually not a very long time. So, Aaron, the average age is about 10 years old. If they push it to 12, that is an exceptionally old male lion. However, it's a tough life for these boys. If, even if they can just make it to adulthood, that's an achievement. Because once they get chased out of the pride, which is normally two and a half, three years old, the next couple of years, the next two, three years of their life is quite difficult as they're moving in between other males' territories, just trying to keep out of sight. And if they're caught, they'll be lucky to come off with a couple of scratches. 
and if not they it can actually well the big males in that area will just end their lives really so it's even just tough uh, trying to make it back of course uh, well to adulthood and then once you get that you can imagine you've seen these boys they've had a couple of altercations with the matimbas but they also quite happily chase the matimbas out of the area and they're strong and fit at the moment so any contenders that want to come through need to be bringing their a game otherwise they're going to find themselves on the wrong side of the claws of the Birmingham which is great I wouldn't mind of course uh, seeing uh seeing a bit of an argument between the Birminghams and perhaps another coalition of males that come through. It would be quite exciting. I'm sure you all agree too. But we're going to hop back aboard onto Tristan's vehicle. He's doing the, the bush baby challenge. He's got two. Let's see if he can find a third one. Indeed. Let's have a look. I'm looking very carefully and we're in a good place for bush babies. These trees that are all around us are terminalias and bush willows and Bush babies like these trees. You see them a lot, particularly on the silver cluster leaf, the terminalia. They like to spend a lot of time there where they harvest the sap. Ah, not a bush baby, but a little scrub here in the road. I'm sorry, little one. I'm just going to turn off my lights so that we do not blind this little r scrub here and let it get into the bush safely. Oh, still on the road. Come on, little one. So they like the roads because it's a little bit safer than it would be in the grass. There's lots of predators in the grass at the moment. So they like to come out onto the roads where they can be able to see that there's no serval or caracal or leopard lying in wait. And that's why they run along. And then only will they duck off the road when there's a little gap in the grass that they can actually see what's going on. The problem is with the lights is that they blind them so they can't actually see where they're going. So I'm going to turn off our lights again and just be able to let this little one carry on with life and I can see it's just bounding down the road at the moment and even though it's very very dark for you guys there's a little bit of ambient light at the moment now come on little one off the road we go sometimes this can go on for quite a long way you end up driving in the dark for a while so while we following behind our little scrub here I'm going to look around to see if I can see any more bush babies and keep our challenge running Thank you very much, little scrub here, which is great news. Oh, elephants. Alright, so guys, we're going to go back across to Taylor because I have a roadblock of elephants, which is not ideal, and so we're not going to put our lights onto them. So, for myself and Darby, we're just going to say good night, and I hope that you've enjoyed your sunset with us. And let's go across to Taylor and see if the Birmingham's are going to wake up in the last few minutes of drive. I think we've been so lucky today, we've had such variety. And oh, before the show ends, quickly, I have to do a quick uh, quiz. Uh, and maybe Megan you can quickly add it up for us. Uh, so who do you think had the cutest sighting today? Was it the hippos splashing about? You've got to be very very quick or was it uh, Tristan's hyena cubs? Hashtag Safari Live. Let's go. We'll, uh, we'll just just have a little guess. I think that the hyena cubs would have been absolutely divine to watch as one. I'm envious because I haven't had little cubs come up to my vehicle in a very very long time but those little darling hippos <clears throat> were also a quite special today as well. So of course it's not a competition. Oh, Megan's just whispered into my ear and she says that she's very sorry to disappoint me and she thinks that the hyenas have won. Rats! In our hearts, Craig and I loved our hippo sighting today. We got some, I think, some sterling shots, especially with that lovely golden light just uh, beaming on through. And I hope the guests that got to see and have a couple of drinks and some snacks at that dam also enjoyed it as much as, as we did. But sadly, we're coming down now to the final seconds of the show. Like I said, we've had lots of variety. We've seen bush babies. We've seen lions. We've seen hyenas. We've seen... Everything that you can think of, giraffe with Steph, many elephants, it's been superb and I hope that you've all enjoyed it and we hope that you all have a great St. Patrick's Day. Remember to join us tomorrow morning for the Sunrise Safari. From all of us here, we'll see you soon.